All right. So um, thank you very much for making it to my talk, which is called Developing Distributed Internet of Things Application Made Easy with Concierge. Long title. Um, my name is Jan Rellermeyer. I'm with IBM Research in Austin, Texas. Normally, I have my two co-committers with me, but uh, they couldn't make it this time. One is on paternity leave. The other one had a conflict, so apologize. Just me today. So Internet of Things, IoT. Um, Let's reflect a little bit about what it really means uh, at the core and, and what the challenges are for writing applications um, or even middleware for, these, um, for this problem domain. So IoT at its core really means making things smart, right? Making everything smart by embedding sensors into things, actuators, um, computer logic, whatever you mean, right? Um, so why is that challenging from an application standpoint? Well you automatically end up with a distributed system, and distributed systems tend to be hard. There's also one thing that I like to emphasize. Um, at its very, very core, IoT is not different from what we've talked about years ago in terms of embedded systems, right? At the end, it's embedded systems. But something has changed in the meantime, and it's kind of hidden in, in one of the pictures, right? You see this mobile phone there? This is really what has changed the expectation of people in terms of how to interact with devices, with smart devices. Because it used to be that the technology was in the center and people had to adapt around the technology. Uh, in the era of smartphones where people are used to user interfaces being simple, being intuitive, interaction being uh, with low friction, um, this is no longer acceptable. And this has really changed the way how we think about IoT these days. In particular, it's no longer acceptable to just deploy a fixed function device and let it run for 10 years with exactly the same functionality, right? People these days expect continuous updates. You have to improve. These days, even automobiles get software updates, right? That's the problem domain in which we are working. And that is, to a certain extent, what motivates the use of technology like OSGI uh, in such a domain. So, we have all these smart devices, uh, which are more or less smart, right? Some of them might have ARM processors, so we can run a relatively standard software stack on them. Uh, some might not be. Some might just be microcontrollers. And in some sense, we proxy them through gateways, uh, which are now smarter, that can aggregate um, information. Ultimately, in a lot of application, the data in the end goes to the cloud, right? Because these devices tend to actually collect quite a bit of data. And we sometimes need the computational power to actually make sense of them. Um, we might call this analytics, we might call this uh, cognitive, whatever uh, your preferred term for it is, right? But um, the data itself is not of any value unless we can actually derive insights from it and act upon it. The other reason might be that we simply need to warehouse the data, and that's another reason why cloud resources might be necessary. Now, in this problem domain, you see something that I've just uh, written in this arrow, right? These days, what people really expect is a continuous software stack. It's no longer acceptable to have a separate team working on the back end, separate team working on the front end. These people are only talking to each other through specifications, right? This will kill you. This is not going to get you to the market in time, right? These days, you will very often have the same people writing front end, same people writing back end. Uh, it's, in the end, it's a consequence of a transition towards a more agile and a more DevOps uh, mode of operation. And you see this in the kind of technology that we use, right? There's one trend that is, in some sense, pushing client-side technology to the server. People know JavaScript from their browsers. It, it's originally a client-side technology, but these days uh, it's used on the server as well because it's actually more efficient if you can have the same team working uh, and they want to use the same technology on both sides, right? Uh, we are looking at a slightly different uh, angle, which is, in a certain sense, bringing server technology back to the embedded device because that's what OSGI has become in the meantime, right? It originally started as uh, a technology for embedded devices, and then the most popular applications were very large applications, like, for instance, the Eclipse IDE, or pretty much every JEE uh, container that you ever cared about, right? Now, we are trying to see how we can push this back to the embedded device and make it run efficiently. So, um, why OSGI on a device <laughs> at all, right? Now, you per possibly know the advantages of Java when it comes to bridging heterogeneity 
And ultimately, that's a challenge that we deal with, right? This, this, this world is, is fragmented. You have many different platforms, many different environments. So um, it's often convenient to have a technology that just bridges the gap and where you can run the same kind of software everywhere. Uh, now, unfortunately, most of these applications tend to be relatively long running. And Java standalone is not very good in maintaining long running applications, especially in view of having to continuously update it. Right? Ultimately, the best that you can do with standard Java without doing some class order hacks is that you just frequently basically shut down your Java to machine and start it up again with, with a new version, which amounts to the same approach that we used to do with operating systems, right? Press button to reboot. Um, I, I would say this is no longer acceptable. And OSGI originally was designed to circumvent this problem, right? It was uh, designed for things like these television set-top boxes where uh, the provider might want to push software updates out to all the clients in a way that does not interrupt their uh, normal operation, right? You don't want people to reboot their television while they're watching a show. That, that's, that's really not acceptable. So part of what OSGI contributes to Java as a concept is the ability to do better uh, than a full reboot. Um, and very often, you can get away with what I call a micro reboot, right? Only uh, restarting the components that are directly affected by an update. Now, to be fair, um, the Eclipse IDE is not an ideal example of that because it doesn't do it, right? And the reason is apparent. It just keeps too much state outside of OSGI. But if you're coding in a pure OSGI sense, you can actually get away with it. So another thing that OSGI is pretty good at, at is uh, managing your class path, right? That's ultimately the unit of modularity that Java by itself uh, up to this, this day supports. You ship your code in terms of Java files. It's very difficult to actually argue what the impact of, a, of an individual Java file is to your application. Uh, and in particular, it's very difficult to say what happens if you update a version of a Java file, uh, let's say a common library to a new version, right? Um, Java doesn't really help you with that. It's, it's a relatively simplistic approach. So uh, in comes OSGI, right? OSGI, uh, I would say the biggest contribution is that we have module management, right? So we have full modules, uh, not only Java files, but Java files with metadata embedded into them. Uh, and most importantly, OSGI modules have to declare their dependencies. So in, by default, nothing is shared in OSGI. Every module is just scoped, locally scoped, and can only see its own content. Whenever you access something outside of your scope, you have to explicitly declare it, declare it in the metadata, traditionally in terms of a package import, and that makes the package available at runtime. It also gives the OSGI environment, which is called a framework, right, a piece of software that is running and maintains your modules, a chance to actually manage those modules and apply an update and do a partial update and you know, ultimately also allow you to unload something uh, in a sense that you restore the system to the state as if this module was never installed. And you see that all these aspects are really important for long running applications. Um, and that's part of what makes OSGI a popular choice in this domain. Now, modules in the end give you management, right? They give you lifecycle management of components. Uh, by themselves, they don't give you loose coupling because if you might imagine, if you're doing package imports, it's still all or nothing, right? A module that has a declared package import cannot run unless there's something in the system that offers this package. It's still, if you want so, a link time dependency. So in addition to uh, doing this uh, module management, OSGI has also introduced the idea of services. And these days, microservice architecture and software is becoming kind of the standard, right? Many people use it. Well, don't forget, OSGI is relatively old already. Well, it, the first version came out in 99. And um, the idea in OSGI is actually very, very powerful, especially for embedded devices, because it gives you a loose coupling through, so, uh, through services at almost no cost. Um, the reason for that is, the way how you register a service in OSGI is you just make an implementation class available under an interface, right? That's the biggest step towards loose coupling because now your software that depends on the service will only have a hard dependency on the interface but not on the implementation, 
which is best practice, but you wouldn't be surprised how many times people don't do that. Right? Just hide it behind an interface. In OSGI, you're forced to do so. Now, at the point where you actually have a component that needs a service, they will request the service from the service registry, which is a central piece of software in the OSGI framework. And what they get in return, if such an implementation is available, is the object itself. So no proxification going on. That's very different to the JEE world. And that's why what ultimately makes OSGI a viable choice on embedded devices, right? You, you just cannot afford things like full proxification. So in OSGI, the services are really what helps you dealing with dynamism, right? Whenever you have optional components, whenever you have things that come and go, turn it into a service and your, your clients can have optional dependencies to these components. Um, they are supposed to listen to lifecycle events, services coming and going. Um, and it's very easy to loosely couple your system in such a way, right? Uh, one of the examples, I don't know if you heard about that, but the whiteboard pattern is a very popular choice in the OSGI uh, world to decouple end to M dependencies, right? Where you have multiple producers, multiple consumers. Traditionally, that would be something that people would implement with listeners, but now every uh, either producer or consumer has to do the bookkeeping of who's there and whom to talk to, and you have the bootstrapping problem and so on. In OSGI, that's very, very simple. Use the service registry, right? The listeners, they register themselves. The clients register themselves. The publisher will just look up. Whoever is there will get the information pushed. Um, so that is a pattern that scales also very well to distributed systems. And, and we've actually used this a couple of times in, in application to make them loosely coupled. So um, that's the value of OSGI to embedded systems, or IoT in particular. Um, what is concierge? Well, concierge started as my personal question as to what the minimum overhead of OSGI can be. Um, many years ago, actually I think it was in 2005, in, during the OSGI World Congress in Paris, um, I was listening to all these great talks and I really wondered what is the minimum amount of footprint that you can implement a full OSGI framework in. And I started to play around. I started to do this uh, as part of my master thesis first and then continued in my PhD. Um, and my answer was I could do it in actually 86 kilobytes um, and with a relatively simple structure. So my original implementation, which, had, uh, which was uh, an implementation of the R3 core standard, um, only had seven Java classes and seven inner classes. And that was um, a relatively complete implementation. So people like this uh, in terms of being fast and lean. Um, they also liked it because it was readable. People actually used my source code to educate themselves how an OSGI framework works internally, how it exactly uses class orders and so on. You might guess that it's a lot easier to do this on an implementation with just a handful of classes uh, as opposed to one that, that is heavily object oriented and has hundreds of classes. Right? Now, I used it on all these devices, which were really the, the um, nice embedded devices uh, of this time. Uh, no Raspberry Pi was around, right? So you had to buy other cheap devices and basically jailbreak them uh, or own them or whatever uh, to make them uh, available as Linux platforms. And, and one of the examples is this Linksys NSLU2. Uh, I don't know if anybody here has ever played with that, but it was a really nice device uh, that you could buy for 100 bucks, basically. Um, and it, it was a full-fledged uh, ARM processor, um, ARM SOC, that was originally intended to be a bridge to connect uh, USB hard drives to your network um, as a kind of a mini storage server. But that meant after you uh, red booted it and turned it into your own device, you had an embedded uh, board that you could install a full Linux on, a full Java virtual machine on, and it was a USB host device, right? So it was really cool. You could connect a couple of peripherals to it. We used it for a lot of fun applications. Um, other things are indeed PDAs or, or some of the uh, wireless routers that had no known vulnerabilities and you could, you could hack them. Um, or these uh, slightly more powerful sensor network devices. That's an Intel IMO2, which um, had an ARM CPU and, and you could run the Java virtual machine on it. Now, um, what was really challenging about uh, these kind of devices was um, Sun at that time wasn't really interested in, uh, in offering a full Java virtual machine for many of those devices. So on quite a few of them, 
you had to resort to either open source implementations that were possibly incomplete, but at least they would not have a very good JIT compiler or no JIT compiler at all. Uh, for some of them, actu they actually shipped JVMs, but they were kind of very weird intermediate things between 1.1.8 and 2. For instance, uh, not this one, but the Sharp Zoros PDA had a version of personal Java, which, which was really weird, but, but a few people used it on embedded. So the, the, the JVMs in, in, in those days were really fragmented, and, and the performance profiles were really, really difficult uh, to handle. Um, the best that you could get in those days, I think, was, was actually the J9 embedded, uh, which was available at least for um, the PDAs if you installed Linux on them. But um, th this one had, had a reasonable JIT compiler. The other ones, they, they, they would not perform very well. Uh, and that was what really drove my design, right? That's why I ended up with so few classes and such a compressed footprint. You, you just couldn't afford being heavily object-oriented and going through multiple levels of dispatch and so on. That, that just wouldn't work because there was simply just no, no JIT compiler cleaning, cleaning uh, up after you, right? So um, we, we managed to get a relatively predictable performance on all these different devices and, and, and that was kind of a big part of the design of it. So fast forward a couple of years later, um, the world was still um, almost the same. Uh, the devices got a little more powerful, but there still wasn't very well-maintained Java virtual machines in those days. Um, OSGI had grown quite a bit, um, and, and I will show you uh, another slide on that. Um, people were increasingly getting a little bit frustrated with running things like OSGI on, on embedded devices, simply because the footprint was getting so large, right? So we had the idea of um, kind of revive the concierge project, uh, bring it to the Eclipse Foundation, and bring it up to speed with the latest uh, level of the OSGI specifications, which was uh, R5 in those days, right? So we tried to get the full R5 um, compatible implementation while keeping all the beneficial properties that the old concierge had. Um, and we were kind of undecided whether we would have to be backwards compatible to Java 5 or 1.4. When we started, uh, Java 8 wasn't released, so it, it seemed like a good idea to be compatible with 1.4 because on many embedded devices, you would only get a 1.4 uh, JME um, CDC implementation as, as the best Java virtual machine that you could use. Um, now, why is it challenging um, in terms of implementing the latest standard? Um, well, if you look at how OSGI has developed in the meantime from R3 to R5, you see that even just the bare API has grown quite significantly from just 28 classes to 99 classes for, for R5. And you see that there are some serious feature additions to, to the standard. Um, some of them might be a, a little subtle, but um, just going into more detail of, of one of them, um, one of the biggest things that we added to R5 is the generic requirements capabilities model and the namespaces model. So previously, um, the only thing that an OSGI framework could really use in order to resolve software was package imports or the slightly ill-defined way of doing bundle dependencies, right? That was basically all. Um, now, on many, in many situations, you have non-code dependencies, and that really comes from application service. You might have things available on your device, and you want your module to only resolve if those things are there, and maybe even get wired towards certain implementations and so on. So um, in R5, we introduced a model where you can basically express everything as a dependency and everything as a capability. And that's, of course, a lot more flexible but it's actually difficult to optimize the common path, right? The common path is still packages. So how do you implement a feature that is generic like that while not sacrificing performance um, on, the, on the very common case? Um, and while keeping the footprint, of course, you could just, you know, special case the packages and it would still perform the same, but then you have code duplication and a relatively clunky system. So many of these requirements um, and, and features that have been added over time really come from app servers because that's where OSGI really took off in, in the last years, right, server side. So um, it was a challenge to give you the same 
functionality that you would have on the server side at a footprint that is still low and that still performs well on embedded devices. But yes, remember, uh, people these days want the contig contiguous software stack experience. So it's out of question to use an old R3 implementation when on the server side you have all the flexibility and, and all the latest API. So uh, where are we now these days? Well, um, we were targeting full R5 compatibility and we achieved this goal. Um, we were going for remaining small and readable and work well on embedded devices. Well, it's not uh, 86 kilobytes, but if you don't need debug symbols, it's still 250 kilobytes, which, which is pretty good if you consider that um, quite a part of that is the OSGI API itself that has grown, right? All the additional classes. So um, it's still um, at, at this time possibly the smallest implementation of an R5 framework. Uh, we want to remain readable. Well, um, currently we have nine full classes, um, multiple more inner classes, I think 45 inner classes, which in the end is a consequence of how Java is structured, right? Many of the APIs actually require that you instantiate anonymous inner classes. But I would say the, the core of, of the framework is still relatively readable, despite its, its unavoidable complexity. Um, and remaining backwards compatible, well, um, in the meantime, 1.8, Java 1.8 was released, um, or sorry, Java 8 was released, and we finally have the compact profile. Um, so we have an up-to-date implementation for embedded devices, and we thought we could go with Java 5 compatibility. Actually, if you wanted to have 1.4, it, it, it's not even that difficult. We just didn't keep the discipline of avoiding uh, enhanced for loops and so on. So it's possibly a couple of hours of, of porting and you would end up with something that if you have a compiler that erases the generics, which are now in the API, it would still run on 1.4. No, no real reason to not be compatible. We just haven't done it. So that's uh, the, the rough benchmark. Um, performance has been a focus of our work, right? So you might question how well do we perform? Now, we have two um, reference platforms that we measure our work on. Um, the one is the BeagleBone uh, Revision A5. Um, that's a slightly older board, but I still like it a lot um, because of one thing. Um, unlike the Raspberry Pi, the BeagleBone has USB to serial, so it's a lot easier to just plug in and, and set it up, right? It's, it's, it's lower, lower maintenance to interact with it. Um, and it, it's, I would say it's a, it's a typical embedded device specification, uh, if you look at it. We have two different virtual machines that we can run on it. The one is the JSE embedded 1.7 uh, implementation, and the other one is a compact one profile that I compiled uh, for Java 8. And the other platform that we're using is a Raspberry Pi B. Um, it's it's uh, slightly more powerful in terms of CPU. Um, but, and, and it has a little bit more RAM, right? Um, and we're running the standard uh, Java. Um, I think that's an open JDK possible um, on this machine. So those are the two reference devices and we are comparing our performance with, I would say, the latest released versions of um, alternative implementations of the OSGI standard. Um, latest except for Equinox. Um, that's possibly not the latest anymore, but it's an R6 framework anyway, so it's, it's a bit of an apples to oranges comparison. Um, we have Knopflerfish, uh, which is an open source implementation, um, and it's one that ex also explicitly targets small devices. Um, it's also the smallest. Uh, you can get a th 320 kilobyte compact profile uh, of it. Uh, of course, Apache Felix, right? Um, latest released version is 540, uh, 675 kilobyte. Um, and then Equinox um, has 1.3 megabyte. That's just the, the bare minimum that you need. So no console, no anything, right? But, but again, that's, that's a higher version of the specification. Um, and I think that's, that's the version that was released with Mars R1. So it's, it's arguably not the, the latest anymore. So, um, what is the first thing, and to some people the most annoying part of the performance of an OSGI framework? It's the startup time, right? Especially if you have to debug and test on the device itself. 
um, having an implementation that is slow to start up can make your debug cycles pretty long and get annoying. Now, um, you see the black bars here. That's the startup time of the JVM itself, uh, which is something that we cannot change, right? From the time that you start it up. Uh, this is just a Hello World class, so from the time that it actually prints to the screen. That's unavoidable. But you see our blue bar is consistently the fastest uh, on all VMs um, on the two different platforms. And you see that other implementations are actually quite a bit slower, um, which is part of the reason why some people find them frustrating to use. Um, so I think that's relatively good. It's in the order of um, two times to three times the startup of, of the bare JVM. Um, so, so I think that's, that's relatively OK. Um, the next thing is the service registry. Um, why is this part important in terms of performance? Well, that's the thing that uh, is possibly in your critical path of your application, right? It's something that you do while your application is running, accessing the service, especially if you, if you lose the couple of your application, you might do it quite frequently. So um, we implemented a stress test um, to test um, the performance of the service registry because there are really no well agreed on benchmarks for, for OSGI frameworks. So in some sense, we had to come up with, with, with our own idea, right? So what we're doing is registering 10,000 services. Um, and then every service has a random value for the same key. So I didn't mention this explicitly, but services can have properties in terms of key value pairs. And you can use filters um, to get a particular matching implementation. So um, this is set up to create collisions, um, to put some more stress also on the filtering. right? Uh, and we have the byte range. That means we have 256 possible values. Um, so you're expecting about um, something between 39 and 40 instances of a service that the filter has to go through. Um, and then we perform uh, 1,000 lookups, um, get service references for a ra random value, again, in terms uh, of bytes. So you're expecting, if, if the random distribution is uh, sane, you're expecting a lookup ratio of about 10% of the services that are registered. So the first uh, part of the performance is registering all these services. Um, and once again, you see uh, we are doing pretty well in terms of performance, especially if you compare it to the other implementations. Um, interestingly, for some reason, Java 8 seems to help with the performance of the service registry. It, it's performing quite a bit better on the BeagleBone, right? That's, that's the same platform. So um, something in, 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 in our implementation uh, is better off being run on Java 8. Um, now, this is the one-time cost of registration. Um, service lookup is more important. Uh, now, service lookup here is, is really difficult to compare because there's one huge outlier, and, and this is Felix. Now, I, I, I talked to the Felix people, and um, they were really surprised because they thought they had optimized it quite a bit. Um, and, and they even thought I wouldn't have measured it against the latest release, but um, that's actually the latest release, and the performance is quite a bit off from the other implementations. So if we zoom in, uh, we see that, again, concierge is, is the most uh, the most performant uh, implementation in terms of service lookups. And yes, that's something that might be in the critical path of your application. Um, so the next thing is getting rid of all the services. Um, again, um, same picture. We, we are outperforming the other implementation. It's, it's not a huge difference, to be fair, right? But still, um, it's, it's our goal to, to beat um, the others and, and be the fastest. Now, this is the services side. So you can see we achieved our goal of keeping an optimized implementation. Um, and yes, services are, um, are critical to many applications. The other thing is, of course, the resolver. Now, the resolver is usually a one-time cost, right? When you start up your application, you have all these modules. They get resolved, uh, wired against each other, and then you have a running application. So it might not be in your critical path unless you're using the resolver um, uh, again, during the runtime by, by installing new bundles or doing updates or, or all these things. Um, now, in order to stress test the resolver, uh, we just gen generated 1,000 random bundles. Um, 
and uh, well, we had a certain recipe of how to generate um, random package constraints. Um, it turned out that this way of doing it uh, seems to be good in terms of randomness, but it just creates too much randomness, right? You would have to run an insane number of repetition uh, because um, the impact of these values um, is just very high on, on the resolving time. So the experiment is not very stable, in other words, right? So uh, what we did instead was we used this recipe and just persisted one random configuration and run it across all the devices to be comparable within useful time, right? And all these uh, things, by the way, are part of our Git repository, so you can just download them and, and use them, them yourself. Um, this, this particular configuration that we use for measurement is, is even persisted in a Java class, so you can look at it. It's stringified. Um, so when we do that uh, on the different devices, um, I have to speed a little bit up, but you see that uh, the installation, again, uh, we are consistently the fastest. Uh, installation of bundles tend to be I.O. bound because um, OSGI frameworks support warm restarts, so to say. And that means they have to persist the bundles to storage. Um, otherwise, if you're installing from, let's say, URL, um, the bundle might not be available anymore if you do the restart. So that tends to be uh, the limiting factor um, in terms of performance. Now, the next thing is the resolution itself. And here you see two remarkable things. The first thing is Knopflerfish was just not able to resolve this, uh, implementation, the, this configuration. I, I talked to uh, the Knopflerfish people last EclipseCon Europe, and based on my test, they found a bug. But so far, they haven't made a new release, so um, I, I, I didn't use their tip of, of their Git repository to test it. I, I will wait for, for them to make a new release and, and see what the performance is. The other one is uh, Equinox is really, really, really slow. Now, um, to be fair, this is the experience that you would have the first time you resolve a new application. Equinox is very aggressive in caching intermediate uh, resolver results. So unless you blast the working directory away, the next time it would actually use these persisted uh, intermediate resolution steps and the performance would be better than any of the other frameworks. But again, um, that's, that's the performance that you get on uh, the first uh, resolution. And part of our uh, working assumption is we are on small devices, so we, we cannot cache so aggressively, right? We just don't have the resources. So that, that makes sense if you're doing really large applications with thousands of bundles. That's, that's not what we anticipate. All right, so um, that was performance. The next thing uh, that you might care about is usability. And usability is really difficult to define for an OSGI framework because what does it really mean, right? Uh, in the end, that's a piece of infrastructure that most people even don't want to see, right? It's something that enables the application, but it's not key. So our definition of uh, usability for an OSGI framework is simply don't be annoying, right? And what does it mean to not be annoying? Uh, stay close to the standard. If, if you implement too, too much special source, people will confuse your features with standard features and they will have a bad experience if they ever try to run it on a different platform for whatever reasons, right? So uh, we resort to the standard um, and that's pretty much all that we offer in our core framework. Except that, of course, every OSGI framework has to give you some extra functionality that is not mandatory, strictly. Um, some frameworks in the past have given you a console. Um, we do something else. We give you a built-in lock service, and I think that's actually something that is really cool in terms of usability. Because one of the worst experiences that people have with OSGI is that at the moment where you uh, structure your application in terms of bundles, you might get a different behavior at compile time than you get at runtime, simply because your build system might use different metadata than your runtime, right? And that can unfortunately manifest itself at application level errors, right? A service is not there, something else is not there, and something in your application all of a sudden doesn't work anymore. Now, what we believe is if you have a single synchronized lock service in your system, which both the framework uses and your application uses, at least you have a chance to correlate these events, right? Application level events to low level things like OSGI. So we give you this. It's, it's really just two classes that we had to add. Um, it's very lightweight, but just having it means you have the same output 
for both the framework and your application. Uh, plus, we made sure that the output that we produce in the framework is actually meaningful and not let uh, too much generic capabilities or whatever shine through so that you can still make sense out of it. Okay, so what else do we have? Well, um, the next thing that we really care about is being easy to deploy, right? That's, that's also part of the experience. Now, we have adopted the file format of Knopflerfish because that was the one that we le uh, liked most, uh, but we have extended it in, in a few ways, right? So the Xox files is simply just a recipe of things that you want to get installed and or started uh, when you start up your framework. In the sense that you can just package your framework, throw in a couple of bundles, write this file, and that's an application that will run, right? Uh, we have extended it in a few ways. For instance, we support wildcards. Um, now, that might sound trivial, but it's actually very important if you're having build numbers, incremental build numbers, right? Because you don't want to rewrite the startup file every time that you make a new build. So, as you see, you just give the major, minor uh, number here, and then use the wildcard. And whatever the latest build is that is deployed, it will match, right? No need to rewrite the file. Um, you can also use variables um, and it will do pattern matching and replacement. That means you can very easily with just one modification uh, switch from let's say a local testing repository to a product, uh, productive repository or to a web repository. Right? So those are the things that based on our experience really matter um, and that really makes your productivity, uh, improve your productivity in the long run. Um, another thing that we've been working on that's not yet released, uh, but only because the CQs were ready for the latest release, um, is to add REST, uh, a REST interface for OSGI. Now, I personally worked on the standard um, for the OSGI lines and wrote the reference implementation, and we will release it as part of um, a new update release that, that we'll hopefully have ready um, very soon. So, um, just one small thing. I want to show you a demo um, that my colleague Tim Verbalen has written. Uh, he's the guy who does all the interesting stuff these days. Um, so, just as an example, how you can use um, concierge in, in a setup, right? Uh, what we have here, you will hopefully see a little better now, right? Is an NVIDIA Jettison board. Um, that's an ARM board. It has uh, pretty good uh, GPU capabilities. And he uses it to do image processing. So he has a webcam here that is connected to this board. We are running concierge there. Uh, and he has this robotic arm. So what he implemented in this setup is a, an orange detection. Right? So you can place objects in front of the webcam. And if the object is not an orange, it will get pushed away. Um, now, the cool thing based on his middleware is because it's modular and you run concierge on all critical components, including what you don't see here, uh, some machine learning in the cloud, you can simply push implementation between the devices. So if you're having a very powerful board, you can run the machine learning, image detection, everything on the board. If you have a more wimpy board, just move it to the cloud, right? It's really seamless based on um, the remote OSGI services that, that we've both worked on during our career. So, um, let's see how, how this works in practice. Is this running? Okay. So, uh, you see we place a lemon and a lemon is not an orange. Correctly detected, right? Uh, now, if we do the same thing with an orange, light turns on, detected correct. Right? That, that's just a little gimmick application, but it's something that, uh, that Tim does a lot with, uh, with his middleware um, and where he really benefits from concierge by simply being able to do applications that are flexible in terms of deployment. All right. So, um, I have absolutely no time talking about what's coming next, but there are a couple of things that we have on our agenda, including R6 compatibility and more bundles, and ultimately enabling other Eclipse projects uh, in the IoT space to transition to our implementation. So, that's all that I wanted to say. Um, try it out yourself. Uh, you can download it. It's actually pretty easy and uh, pleasant to use, um, and I'm happy to take any questions, possibly.